You're watching 12 WKRC TV, a new generation of news. 12 Newsmakers starts now. Good morning and welcome to Newsmakers. For most of us, our homes are our most important and valuable possession. When it is time to sell it, we like to brag to the realtor and to every potential buyer about the improvements we have made and every advantage the house and the neighborhood has. The more the value is driven up over the price we pay, the happier, you, happier we are. But when the government appraises the value for tax purposes, we want the figure set as low as possible. Don't those invisible appraisers see how old the furnace is, how ugly the teenage son's room is since he painted it black? And what about those neighbors with the barking dogs? Currently, the owners of every one of Hamilton County's 341,000 parcels of property are receiving booklets like this one in the mail. The booklet includes the current property value plus a tentative new value. It also includes information about how the appraisal value was determined and what to do if you don't think it's right. For the sake of context, here are some broad trend lines reflected in this year's countywide reappraisal. The value of all property in the county rose 17.1%. The value of all residential property increased 18.88%. Inside the city of Cincinnati, the value of residential property increased 21.5%. The reappraisal values are tentative. Property owners can challenge them. The booklet explains the process, but I thought it would be useful to invite Dusty Rose, the Hamilton County Auditor, whose office is responsible for the reappraisal process to join us on Newsmakers this morning. Dusty, welcome back to Newsmakers. Thank you, Dan. Good to be here. Um, Dusty, how is this reappraisal done? I got to tell you, I didn't see any appraisers wandering around my house. I don't remember them coming. They've been working over the last two and a half years and, and going around, <clears throat> excuse me, going around the community to view all the property because in this reappraisal we have to physically look at every piece of property. But what does physically look at it From mean? the outside from the outside, go around it, walk around it. Do you walk around it? Oh yeah, in a lot of so cases Somebody actually do. walked around oh, my right. house oh, and sure. I just didn't know about right. it? Right, sure, it probably happened during the daytime. We always notified the, the police that we're gonna be in this neighborhood, we're gonna be looking. People had identification and they walked around the property to, to take a look at it and physically view it. This wasn't one of these drive-by deals where they drive down the street and take a look like okay. that. So they've been looking at the property. Uh, the thing is the numbers that we're getting are coming from comparable sales. And unless you've been watching the real estate market, maybe you don't realize what's been going on in your neighborhood. Because these are pretty impressive uh, right, right. upticks in, because sure. this is, these, the current value is only three years old, is that correct? Well, yes and no. The, the, what, what happened was six years ago, we did a reappraisal like this. Okay, same thing. Uh, effective January 1st, 1993. Three years in, we did a statistical update which didn't require the viewing. So all that was was a statistical increase. But when I see current value, right. that's from three years ago. Well, it's from January 1st, 96, adjusted off of 93. So it, it may not be as good as the 93 value. Well, but it still is a, it was adjusted. It's an approximation. Because right. I got a kick up in sure, the first three sure. years, too. But you know, the, you know the thing that's so interesting, Dan? If, if you see this and, 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 and you're doing the percentages, and that's what everybody does. They look at the percentages. We don't do percentages. I mean, I don't care. It, it, percentage is not the issue. The issue is current market value. And then after that, everything else follows. And it may be up 25, it may be up 43, it may be up 19, but your taxes aren't going up by that amount of money. And we're going to get to that in a minute. Okay. We're gonna get, right. Believe me, we're going to get to that. All right. Um, do some people's houses fall? Are there cases where values fall? A little, yeah, sometimes. Sometimes that'll happen. Yep. Maybe because, they'll drop because of what's going on in the neighborhood. What about, okay, what's going on in the neighborhood, I understand. What about somebody comes through and those appraisers say, this place has gone to pot in the last six years? Yeah, condition is a factor, right. Condition is a factor and it will lower the value. Sure, if, okay. it, if it's one of these stick but out like But generally sort of things pieces. go up. Generally, that's what, that's what our economy has done over the last okay. how many years. Okay. Uh, now, some people aren't happy with the figure they're seeing sure. in terms of the increase. And I know the book is very clear about what to do, but let's sure. just go over it real quickly. What can you do if you do have questions and then if you have objections? Okay, what we're doing, and we don't have to do this, by the way, this is an extra effort that we've made. We're having informal neighborhood hearings all across the county through the end of July. 
and you can come to one of those hearings. In fact, let, yeah, let's be clear. We've got a little footage from Turpin High School right. uh, from the other night. Right. You're doing what, 30-something of these? 46, I think, or 46 48, of these. Know, something like that. Okay, and when people come, what actually happens? They, they sit down, they go through, and they print out the information, and then they sit down one-on-one -on -one with an appraiser. Okay. They this can talk to an appraiser individually. This isn't a meeting and it, type. And an thing. appraiser who can actually make decisions and say, I believe something needs to be looked no, at here? Oh, sure. They can say that the final decision will be made right. later, but, but they'll gather the information and turn it in, and then we're going to review everything that we get. So if you've got a question, the only thing you can do is go to one of these community meetings or there's preliminary things you could do even before that can they call your office for information we, we're can taking they? information off these forms on a homeowner response form they can they can write yeah, back here in the back. right they can write in they can send in on the web uh, they can uh, call if they want I mean there's a number of different ways to reach us but we want to hear from people obviously we want people to let us know and what they do is go to this informal step and then very briefly we're going to give them the final value in November once the state approves it of course, if they don't like that, then they can go through the board of revision process, and and, and, and that's another stage. Sure, down. that's okay. All, but this is the informal, a chance for us to correct an obvious error. We're going to have the telephone number and the web address a little bit later Great. here. But let's talk now. You've just, you, yeah, your me, office, all myself, <laughs> yeah, all by yourself. Uh, you know, increased a person's value of their house. Does that mean if my the value on my house went up uh, eighteen percent? my taxes are instantly going to go up 18%? Well, no, and, and, and we haven't increased it really, Dan. I mean, what we're doing is reporting on the market. Well, we're, I, we're the messenger. Okay. I mean, I mean it's, oh, right. you've increased my value. But no, have I you haven't. increased my taxes? No, no, the point is I haven't done that either. Uh, we have reported on the increase in value. And then what happens? In most cases, anything over the first 10 mils is reduced by the state rollback factors. And the easiest way to understand that is if you have to vote your schools, and you do 10 mils, to give them 10 million bucks. Okay. Okay, easy numbers to remember. 10 mils, give them 10 million bucks. Then Dusty comes through and reports that the value has doubled in that area. The school does not get 20 million dollars and the millage doesn't stay at 10. It drops to five. And they still get the same 10 million. So, with some exceptions, and there are, of course there's always gotta be exceptions because state tax code is, 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 as my dad used to say, a dog's dinner, it's a mess. It's impossible for any <laughs> rational human to understand at any one sitting. Uh, but w with some exceptions, it rolls back, and in most cases, that's what's going to affect people. It, it, it's going to drop back depending on what happens in the area. Yeah, let's be clear, because I, I think people have a hard time oh, understanding this kind of thing. Nobody so understands if, it. So if a school system or uh, some other entity, the mental health board or some other group, comes and says, we need a tax increase or a tax levy. Right. They don't actually say how many mills they want. They say the total amount, and, and we then figure somebody the figures out we the millage. In our office. And it's the amount they've set. Right. So they need 10 million, and that whatever that millage is that it takes to get it over the number of years, that's it, sure. right? So sure. values go up, millage comes down. Right. And in the future, after these are set after November, right. school system comes along and says, now we need 20 million uh, for whatever is in fact the millage that's going to have to be set lower because the values are higher? Well, sure. Okay. Absolutely. All that's, right. that's, that's the way it works, and it always has worked that way since about 1978. But when you hear the schools crying about House Bill 920 and we want inflation, 920 is what sets everything back. They think they should get the inflation amount. And of course, in times like this, when the market's booming, it's a windfall. Right. If, if that exists. An unvoted tax increase okay. windfall is what some people are looking for, and of well, course, there's a lot of people. I suspect. Um, Politicians are going to take a look at this and say values have gone up. We can probably roll back some taxes. Is well, I, I n not not often because the taxes are automatically rolled back. Any place they're not rolled back? Yeah, in the city of Cincinnati, they've exempted themselves from uh, from the rollback. And Madeira has done the same thing. How can they do that? Well, by vote of the council. It's called charter millage. Nobody understands what's happening, and 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 what happens is that when the values come out the money comes in and, and they get more money because the taxes aren't rolled back. Do they get more money on what? What part, I mean, again, that millage that we pay okay, in taxes, okay. there's a lot of different entities there. city gets 6.1 million, I mean 6.1 mills. Okay. 6.1 mills above the 10 mil limit. So the uh, 10 mil limit is just a floor. That's, well, that's the inside millage. That's okay. all divvied up at them. They get 6.1, <laughs> okay? All right. Okay, the values go up, that 6.1 is going to give them more money. Okay. See, if the values and go up, Cincinnati, they're going to get more money. Madeira, are there other places? I, not that I know of, but okay, there not may in this be county. some. Okay. 
but at least in those two, and of course Cincinnati's the big, biggest sure. city. So would some people be interested in rolling that back? I would think it'd be a great idea. I mean, if, if rather than creating a whole new bureaucracy and figuring out some kind of a new, uh, oh, we'll give you a rollback if your grandmother was born on the 4th of July and this type of thing. I mean, they've got all this stuff. Let's simplify it. Let's take away something, which take away the, the non-reduction of the charter millage and give everybody a break. See, that's always been my problem over the years. With You, you do the abatements for the people that squeal the loudest. But when you're doing abatements, Dan, who's picking up the slack? It's the working stiff who doesn't know anybody or the guy out there who's paid his taxes faithfully for years that can't add a big room or something, and he's going to pay more. The more you abate, the more burden falls on the, on the middle class taxpayer. And that's the problem. So what, I, what, what my point is, is let's let the reduction factors work across the board and, and let's let everybody get that benefit. The bottom line here is the citizens of Cincinnati and Madeira have to look at this a little bit differently than the citizens in the rest of the county. On a part of their tax, right. right. And, if, and if you're voting a new school levy this year, which, you've got to look at it differently too because that's going on at the new value. Okay. And some people are, and, th and that's another problem. You see, it's all a, a question of right. where you happen to fall. The important thing for the taxpayer is this is a reflection of your market value. And if you believe it is your market value, we're done. Do not think, however, that your taxes, in most cases, are going to jump by the amount that your value jumps because it just isn't so. Okay. We're just about out of time. I want to do a couple of practical things here. Good. First, we've got a phone number that we want to uh, show people. Here it is. If you've got questions on your appraisal, you can call 946-4663 or the cute way, 946-HOME. Right. And then there's also a website. If you've never logged on to this website, believe me, this is one you want to log on to, www. Hamilton County Auditor, all run together, dot org, O R G. Right. And it, there's lots of fun things on yeah, your website that's right. and growing all the time. Yeah. Um, Dusty, thank you very much. Uh, one quick last question. What has been the reaction, or can we just predict it when people see that their values go up this month? People are, are to some degree concerned, but we've been talking to the people at the meetings because we've had a week of them so far. Everybody's been very, very pleasant. And, and, and some of them have brought us information that indicates that we've made mistakes. I know it's hard for you to hear a politician you? admit he made a mistake, but uh, we make mistakes and we want to correct them and we don't want to disadvantage anybody. So. Okay. Well, thank you for being here. And if this uh, gets out of control somewhere down the road, we'll have you back. Hey, so, great. Okay. Thanks, Dan. <laughs> Stay tuned. After the break, we'll be joined by a former mayor, former member of Congress, a former TV anchorman who announced this week that his future lies in going back to his roots. 10 or 15 years ago, I always sensed that I was on this political track to do other things. Uh, right now, I just want to do this. I guess it just feels right for me to be in politics. It feels right for me to be involved in the city of Cincinnati at what is going to be a critical time in our history. In the 1980s, Charlie Lucan served nine years on Cincinnati City Council six as mayor, and then at the beginning of the 1990s, one term in Congress. But because he shared City Hall space with some other smart, talented, and tough politicians, including Ken Blackwell, Guy Guckenberger, Steve Shabbat, Dave Mann, Pete Strauss, and Bobby Stern, no one ever mistook the 80s for the Lucan decade. Given that it seems that Char uh, Curly, Larry, and Moe are in control of City Hall these days, the likely return of the always affable Charlie Lucan seems like a burst of light. But before we turn recent history into nostalgia, remembering the past as we wish it had been, and Charlie into a caped superhero, let's recall a few things. Those were the days when the city switched developers midstream on Fountain Square West, missed the building boom, and ended up with a very nice parking lot. And it was Charlie Lucan who led the charter reform that made the top vote getter the automatic mayor, a change that almost everyone now agrees was a terrible mistake and got changed, we will find out if it really fixed anything in the future, by the adoption of issue four, the direct election of the mayor six weeks ago in the May primary. No one has a program that absolutely positively will make Cincinnati an urban exemplar. So why does Charlie Lucan want to come back right now? And what is his agenda? To begin to explore those questions, I am joined this morning by Charlie. Charlie, welcome. Thank you, Dan. To the nice to be here. Nice to be back. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk politics. Let's do. Why now? Why now? Because it, it felt right. I think that the city uh, is at a critical place, Dan, and, and it's at a juncture. 
it, people have been down. Their perception of the city has been a little low over the last few years. I think the pendulum has the opportunity to swing back. And uh, I, some of the changes coming on in downtown, some of the changes, the issue four, the passage of issue four, whether it's for me or anybody else, I think it signals a change. And with that change, there's an opportunity to move this city in a more positive direction. And all I can tell you is, and you know my history, uh, it, it kind of in the blood, and uh, I'd like to be a part of it. Yeah. You know, when you say, uh, when we're talking about timing, when you talk about it in terms of city situation and things that are happening downtown or about to happen and come online, also in a personal way, um, is this a good time for you? Let me throw out a scenario. You know, everybody says, oh, gee, he's going to be the top vote getter and become mayor. They but, do. <laughs> but your father found out I know. that it's not necessarily that easy in this system. But is this a good thing to run once before we get the new type of mayor? Well, we're talking now practical politics. Dan. Yeah, be, I, and, and you do can, think can, candid, uh, Yeah, and candidly, I think that uh, whoever is elected mayor this time, be it me or Charlie Winburn or Todd Portoon, whoever it is, will certainly have a leg up in that, in that uh, free-for-all that may occur a couple of, of years from now. Uh, at the same time, I think trying to anticipate politics two years down the road, I've learned over the years, is, is just very difficult to do. So um, I'm not sure. Whatever the change is, my sense is it's, it's an opportunity for the city, and it's going to be an exciting time for the city, and I'd like to be a part of that. Well, you were saying in your announcement the other day, you said some very hard things about the city manager. Not the system, not the concept of uh, manager, council manager form of government. You said John Shirey. Right. And this council has to make it. If you were on council right now, how would you evaluate John Shirey's job up to this point, and what would you recommend? I think, I think Mr. Shirey's had, had problems, but what I can't not evaluate, because I haven't been there, is, is the accountability issue, and that's one of the problems with this system. Uh, is it council's fault? Is it the manager's fault? But, but Dan, if you've watched city council meetings, and I have watched them on the cable. We've had to. Of late. Uh, you have a situation where the city manager is sitting there like a pincushion. He's taking all the shots from the mayor and all the members of council, and he's responding by saying, if you don't like it, fire me. That's a poisonous atmosphere. And what I said in the press conference is, this week the city council is going to evaluate the manager, and it's time to either get on the same page and move forward together or make a change. Well, now, you know, years ago, Cy Murray said to me, a manager starts with a certain number of chips on his side of the table, he plays them out, he's got to look when that stack runs down and he's got to get out. Right. Has, even if he's the best person in the world, because that's part of politics, right. part of public life. Right. Has, uh, I mean, uh, let's be, let's cut to it. Has, has Shirey's, have, has his stack of chips run out? His stack of, of chips is very, very low, and unless city council is willing to give him a new stack, by saying, you're our man and here's our agenda, I think that the relationship probably has reached an end. Okay. Well, let's go to one other person, Andy Udris, head of economic development. And if you're around City Hall at all, you know economic development is just takes even more punches than John Shire. Right. And, it, you know, one disaster after another. What's your view about that? Would you be encouraging the manager make that change at economic development? I would be encouraging the manager to do some of the things the council is now suggesting, which is to go outside. You know, these development projects are not going to happen, in my opinion, with bureaucrats inside City Hall. You, you remember we did the, the SMAIL Commission or the Infrastructure Commission uh, back in the 80s. Right. I think we need that kind of outside input for development, particularly housing. But the only way these projects are going to move, and I, and I think that, and I, I mention housing because I think it's one of the great opportunities for Cincinnati. I think people are tired, tired of sitting on expressways, and I think they're ready to... Um, come home if we can give them a reason. Uh, I, I think we need some outside enthusiasm, energy, dollars, and uh, I think that's, that's the answer. So would you support the mayor and Heimlich's recent proposal uh, to create a new entity that is, is a privatized development agency? Would, would you I, get behind that? I think that's the right direction. My concern is, for example, um, you have this uh, DCI downtown Cincinnati. Right. You know, they were incorporated to do things, development, or, and move downtown Cincinnati right. forward. I mean, what's their role in this? I don't want to create another set of... So, of, so maybe it's just giving DCI some new responsibility. May, I, I, what I'm saying or is the that you have to be very careful when you structure it. That you know, it you brought sense. up the Smale Commission. I can remember a conversation you and I had about the Smale Commission. You, you said to me 
that city at that time, that's, this is over a decade ago, I think this was the last day you were in the mayor's office. You said to me, Smale Commission didn't tell us anything we didn't already know about Correct. the conditions. It was just borrowed authority. Credibility. The credibility. The city had no credibility left, you had to go to the business community and get borrow theirs. It, if that was the situation a decade ago, where are we today and whose authority can we borrow? What we have to do, Dan, and we can, is change the perception of the way city council is viewed. You know, you know from watching city council over the years that, that the fact is that the perception is 90% of the deal here. And if we can get a couple winners downtown, and I'm not shy about telling you I support the expansion of the Cincinnati Convention Center. Uh, because I think it's one of the winners that can change the perception uh, of, of, of our city. Uh, if we can change the perception and, and borrow the credibility by getting the, the experts from the outside involved, I think that the opportunities are limitless for the city of Cincinnati. And is that what's happening with the Rouse Commission on the riverfront that, you know, is working right now and now has asked for a 60-day extension and won't report until September? Uh, do you think that's the right approach, and do you, do you like what you see coming out of that commission? I, I, I'm liking it more. I, you know, as you remember, they proposed originally, or the city proposed the originally. The city of, pro proposed, uh, uh, yeah, the mall. Uh, the mall concept, which I think was the wrong direction to go, and I think everybody recognized that, and I think now we're getting some more sensible proposals. Again, the pendulum, I think, in the, in the new millennium, um, is going to swing back for the city. Remember the bicentennial. I mean, everybody was happy and projects were happening and people were moving into town. And wore little pig hats. And wore little pig hats, which was great, great fun. I remember Arne Bortz coming into council right. with a pig snout on and the, the great pig debate of 1988. Um, but I think that, that if we can change the attitude about City Hall, I think that this can be. Okay. What, what else is on your agenda? You want to change the attitude, but you got to change substance too. What else is you out gotta, there? You got to change substance. I mean, I, I mentioned something. I, the, the, convention center expansion because I think that there are a lot of people running for cover on this issue and what I want to say about the convention center is if we can get a 405 million dollar investment in the city if we can get private contributions and county contributions and state contributions and for goodness sake they're even talking about helping us in northern Kentucky if we can get that kind of investment in downtown Cincinnati well wh where what's the city what sh the city passed a new one and a half percent hotel tax what else should the it's city a, it's, do it's it's that is only something to get the ball started. You know as well as I do, that's a very small piece of a large puzzle. And the city of Cincinnati is going to have to, at some point, come up with more to do that. And uh, do they, buying, but, buying and clearing the land behind the convention center, for example, which is what we did with the, when we did the Aronoff Center, and which we did with other projects. These are the kinds of things that the city of Cincinnati is going to have to do. And the city's got to take the lead on this, right? Because the city owns the thing and, in the end. And even th though that thing, that, that small piece that they did uh, this past Wednesday, it, it doesn't come close to getting the job done. Uh, it, it is a step forward, and they that to me, I've been critical of city council, but that to me was an important first step, and I applaud them for doing it. What about the environment inside council chambers? And you know, is it significantly different than it was when you were there? Yeah. And I, I listed the names of the people. Yeah, it is different. Why? It, it, is, it, is, di it is different because, I mean, you know, you pointed out in, in the intro, I mean, these people, Dave Mann, Ken Blackwell, Steve Shea, but these people weren't babes in the woods when it came to politics. And they're not the good old days in the sense that everything was sweetness and light. But I do think that there was a little more civility. Uh, to one another. I do think that if I, if, if I went to Ken or, or Guy and said, look, we, we need to do this for the good of the city, shut up and vote, uh, I, that kind of thing happened. Uh, it didn't happen all the time. But, but we could come together on, on things. And I, and I, you I know, think one of the reasons people say that doesn't happen anymore is because uh, now you get the top vote getter automatically becomes mayor. Do you regret that uh, decision? I, I do not. And I got to tell I, you, I, I've described it as King Me, I'm Charlie Lucan Amendment. Well, so. I, I don't, I, I see, my view of it is, is a little bit different than most people's. And I, and I know in your introduction you've said the popular thing, which is that it has been a disaster. Um, Nobody really seriously thought in the late 80s, if I would have not run first, it would have been a surprise. If Roxanne Qualls would have not run first in the last few elections, it would have been a major political surprise. I think good people can make a bad system work. Bad people can make a good system work. So I think what we're really talking about here is for the voters to get involved and look at the candidates and try to elect people who are going to 
try to build a consensus. But no, they called it the Lucan Amendment, and they called it. Uh, it they, was. It was. A, well, uh, we're out of time here, and I got a feeling you may be back before November. So nice to have you back. It's good to see you again. Yeah, good to see you again. All right. Uh, and thank you for making Newsmakers a part of your Sunday morning. Join us again next week to hear the men and women who are shaping our community for the future. Have a good week.